let's dive in. Let's talk about focus. Hocus Pocus by Focus. Um, Brilliant song. Yeah. Uh, I remember being at a party many years ago with my friend Emily and uh, uh, turning to her and saying, drunkenly, you know, like, let's focus. And she said, as a lens does. And I, it's one of the most beautiful phrases I've ever heard, let's focus as a lens does. And I want to talk about focus and why it's important, because we live in a world of enormous distraction. There's so much stuff that's going on around us, there's so much information that's coming at us all of the time, that just as we've been talking in previous weeks about minding our own business and starting to know where our boundaries are and getting selective about what we let in, you know, we have to choose which things we want to be distracted by and which things we don't. But then, even within the stuff that we let in, right, even within the stuff that is within our system that's actually important for us to be doing and isn't just distraction, there's so much stuff there that we have to make some decisions about what we're going to focus on. And how do we do that? How do we more effectively exclude the things that aren't important and, among all the things that are important, choose the ones that we're going to focus and work on right now. And I think there are a number of benefits to getting more systematic and having some tools to help us focus, which I'm going to introduce today. One of which is, oh, is it going to catch up? Oh yeah, sort of stress reduction. You know, the, the, the thing is that it's very, very difficult to go through life when, we're, uh, when we know that we've got lots of balls in the air, right? And the secret to dealing with that is to start to have containers into which you can put the balls so that you no longer have to keep juggling them, right? So it's about, say, so part of learning uh, about how to be more effectively focused is about stopping worrying about the things that you're not doing, right? That's often the source of a lot of worry and stress is the thought that, you know, I've got these 15 or 20 things that I'm supposed to be doing right now and I can only really do one thing. Okay, so what can we do to make it easier for ourselves about the fact that there are 19 things that we're not doing at any one point in time? Well, the first thing that we can do is to sort of get them out of our head and into a system that will capture that for us. Uh, and then uh, once we've got them in that system, we can start to like reflect on them in a more uh, deliberate way. You know, the example that um, uh, comes from the, yeah, uh, so a, a good example of this is the idea of like, uh, maybe there's somewhere in your flat that is uh, particularly messy, right? Like maybe there's a, a one cupboard or one room where things have just sort of deteriorated over time into a terrible mess. And every time you open the door or every time you pass it, you sort of think, ugh, you know, and close the door and run away, right? Now. Every time you see that and you experience a certain amount of stress about the fact that that cupboard or that room is really untidy, it's part of the stress is because, you know, you sort of don't have anything to do with that worry. You don't have anywhere to park it. Well, what I'm going to suggest today is... Oh, the video... Oh, great. Better now, thank um, Yeah, so, looking at that kind of, that, that messy room, right? One way to deal with the stress is, yeah, once we start to recognise, oh, what's going on here? is that I, I've got a desire to, to tidy this up, but not the time, right? But once we sort of surface that desire and capture it, we can reflect, actually, how important is this for me? And if we can have a way of saying, oh, wait, I mean, I don't like the fact that it's messy, but the task of tidying it up is less important to me than all of these other things that I'm doing, maybe we start to reduce the amount of worry that we get from looking at the mess because we go, oh yeah, it is messy, I don't like it, but wait, there are other things that I want out of my life because I'm deliberately putting my focus on the things that are important. Um, so uh, there are some things that your brain is good at and there are some things that your brain is bad at. And the light bulb moment is a great example of this. We're really, really good at remembering that we need to buy a new light bulb when we're standing in the hall, in the dark, and the light bulb isn't working, right? We're very bad at remembering that we need to buy a light bulb when we're in a supermarket, going in because we, you know, are picking up food for, you know, dinner or whatever, right? And we're there, that's where the bulbs are, but we're thinking about something else. We don't get a reminder from our brain to buy bulbs at the moment when we're next to bulbs. We get a reminder when we see the broken bulb. It's not very helpful. It doesn't really actually get the problem solved. So maybe what we need is a system that reminds us 
of the need to buy bulbs so that when we find ourselves in the context where we can solve that problem, there's a reminder available to us that we get queued to do that at the moment that it's useful. Uh, so, you know, there's a thing that uh, Dave, Dave Allen, who we're going to meet shortly, says, which is, your head is for having ideas, not for holding them. So part of the way that we're going to, I'm going to suggest that we can achieve better focus, it, oh, oh, it's, oh, it's not caught it up. Oh, so, um, uh, somebody, have you guys got Slack open? Mm -hmm. We just keep an eye in if remote people, if the signal drops, we just pop onto Slack and let us know, please. Yeah, so your head is for having ideas, not for holding them. So learning that we want to, I mean, I mean it's kind of interesting that we think about this, right? Like our, 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 our brain is, so, so the point about the light bulb is our brain is kind of bad at remembering things. But yet so often we use it for remembering things. And maybe we could use an external tool to take that strain off the brain. I mean, even if you have a really awesome memory, right? Even if you don't have any problem with this kind of light bulb situation, your brain has limited bandwidth. What do you want to use it for? You know, if you're using up all of your bandwidth downloading cat videos, no wonder you can no longer have a Hangouts conversation when you need to, right? Like, what do you actually want to use that power for? And in some ways, like maybe five or ten years ago, we'd have framed this conversation by saying, um, you know, there are some things that, that, that your brain can do that computers can't, like creative thinking. But obviously, increasingly, the AI revolution, etc., like computers can also do creative thinking as well to some degree. So the question is not really about whether or not computers can or can't creatively think. It's about what do you want to use your mind for? Do you want to use your mind for trivia or do you want to use it for creativity? And I suggest that probably all of us would rather use it for creativity, right? That it's actually a more rewarding experience if we do it that way. Um, uh, another idea which... Uh, oh, so, so kind of where are we? I wonder if I can orient us. So, um, uh, yeah, we're trying to think about the importance of focus in a, uh, in a busy world, in a world full of distraction. It's good for us to achieve focus because it allows us to reduce stress. You know, we have stuff parked in a place that we can trust. It allows us to start to use our brain in a more deliberate way so that it does the stuff that we're good at and the stuff that we enjoy. But here's another thing to think about when we look at the topic of focus, right? The future is a myth. It's an extremely powerful and an extremely useful myth, but it is nevertheless a myth. It is culturally created. There was some date in human history when the future was invented, and before which there was no such thing. Because the future is us taking all of the stuff that hasn't happened yet, and sort of somehow magically bringing it through the power of myth, through the power of shared ideas, back into the present moment which does exist. Right? and sort of cre curating it and doing stuff to it. Right? It's really, really interesting that we, that we have this capacity and that we have such a rich and complex idea about the future. But the future really doesn't exist. All there is is here and now. So again, there's something about focus, which is can we bring our focus more onto the here and now and allow ourselves to only interact with the myth of the future to the extent that it's helpful? Right. Again, a lot of stress, worry, anxiety is based around us getting too caught up in something which doesn't exist, the future, rather than engaging with stuff that's here, right? So choosing what are we going to bring in and engage with here, and focusing on that, and spending less time concerning ourselves with the future can be really useful. Um, oh, the future is a minute. Oh, yeah, great. Okay, so there's a, there's a technique. So we, we, we're kind of, uh, and let's, let's talk about that technique. So we're kind of familiar with Brian, right? We met Brian before, and this is Dave. Oh, these are terrible pictures at this scale, but never mind. Nevertheless, this is, uh, this is Dave, and this guy is called Dave Allen, and he is the inventor of GTD, or Getting Things Done. A couple of copies of this upstairs, as usual. You know it. Um, <laughs> and... Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I've just yeah, had a bit of a moment there by myself. Um, I, I think this is a really good book and Dan hates it. That's, that's what I'm going to say as a, as a bit of a kind of, uh, of a warning uh, and an introduction to it. And, you know, like, here's maybe one reason why... I remember when I first saw a, a, a copy of this on Friends Bookshelf that I scoffed because it reminded me of Rimmer's Revision Timetable. For those of you who have watched any of The Red Dwarf from the 90s, there's a sort of famous story in this that, that Rimmer spent so long putting together his revision timetable and colour coding it, etc, 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 that he never did any actual revision. So there's sort of something about, why should I read a book about getting things done when I could just go and get stuff done, right? And, I mean, yes, to some degree that is true. 
And then there is also another thing which is like, if you don't produce a revision timetable at all, if you don't spend any time on that, how do you know that you've revised everything that you need to revise? Like I always remember being told for uh, like exams, you know, spend a third of the time that you have on each essay question planning the answer, and then two thirds writing it, right? Because otherwise, how will you know whether you covered the most important things that you wanted to cover? So there is sort of a bit of a value in this saying, well, you know, let's read something, let's learn something about how to get stuff done so that we can get more stuff done, even though it takes us away from getting stuff done. Yeah, it's a bit of a kind of paradox. So how does it work, right, getting things done? I mean, the book can take you through it. I'm sure you can go out and find, you know, videos, podcasts, whatever it is that you want to... Yeah. And I'm going to pick out the things that I think are most important and that I find most valuable in GTD as an approach for increasing focus. And the first thing is this principle of having a trusted system. Now, what I really wanted to say was, you know, you want to have a net without holes in it. And I thought, well, I mean, a net sort of <coughs> has got holes in it, hasn't it? But, like, there's a difference between the kind of, like, the deliberate holes in a net versus, like, a rip that, you know, all the fish can get through. So, that's one of the key I things. I love deliberate holes. That's awesome. That's one of the key things in, thank you, that's one of the key things in, um, in, in GTD is this idea of if you want to start using your brain for the stuff that it's good for and for the stuff that you want to use it for, so having ideas and not holding them, you need somewhere to hold them, right? You need a container to put the balls that you're trying to juggle down into. But that container will only actually allow you to focus more, will only actually reduce your stress if you trust it completely. If you believe that anything that you take out of your head and put in there is now stored safely. And my experience is this really does work. Right? This really does work if you have one trusted place where you know that everything gets funneled to and gets captured. So in GTD, you may have like multiple inboxes. You may have multiple places in your life where new stuff comes into you. But you should have a limited number of places, like the smallest possible number of places that you can manage, where stuff ends up. Um, because then you know when you want to go and find stuff which you've decided to keep in your world, you know where you can get to. Right. So the first thing is have a trusted system. I mean, in practice, this just means for me, you know, like, have one to-do list. Very occasionally, I might branch off a main to-do list into, like, a shorter list for the day. But if that starts to persist for more than a few days, I make sure that it goes back in. Like, don't allow yourself to end up with lots of lists in different places, because then you start to think, wait, did I capture that thing? Where was it? And then you're trying to remember it, and then suddenly your brain's back into the juggling wheel, spinning plates, not really sure whether things are under control or not. So to get, get stuff under control, have a trusted system. That's one of the first key principles. And then the next key principle is about projects and next actions, right? Which is terminology that we're maybe familiar from in like we use that in the civil constitution, etc. But it's this really key thing, which is uh, you can't do a project, right? You can never actually, and this is a sort of a bit of a circular argument, because that's how we define a project. We define a project as something that you can't just go and do, as opposed to an action, which is something that you can go and do. So it's something that I want to say, like, um, you know, uh, like, redecorate my bedroom. That's, that's a project. I can't just go and you know, like, do it. If I was to envisage it, like, oh, I'm, I'm redecorating my bedroom, well, what am I actually engaged in doing? Well, I guess one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to choose what colour do I want it to be. Okay, so there's an action. That I actually go out and start investigating the colour that I want it to be, get some paint samples, great. Now I'm taking an action. And this key principle in GTD is about breaking your projects down into actions. Turning things that are complex, big goals that you want to achieve, goals that are bigger than one step anyway, goals of potentially any level of complexity into one thing that you can do right now to advance yourself towards that goal. And that is just such a powerful thing to do. Now, not everybody likes doing this, and if you're following GTD really strictly, like they say, every project that you have should have a next action all the time. And the Constitution says to us, 
that we have to uh, regularly break down any projects that we have into next actions. And anybody can say to us, hey, for that project that you hold, what's the next action that you're going to take? So it sort of doesn't say that we have to have, track a list of next actions for every project, but we're required to think about it, and on demand we have to be able to say it. And, and this is why, right? It's because projects just sit on your list. It's like your eye just sort of glances over them because they're just somehow too complex to do. And then we're into a focus trap. Because if on a list we have some things which are very concretely actionable and some things which are just a bit more complex, we can't actually just go and do them, we'll look at that list and we'll go, oh, you know, like our attention and our eye will gravitate to the things that we can just do. Maybe those aren't the most important things, right? Maybe because they're so simple, they're, they're, they're less important and the bigger, big picture project just never gets started on. Well, one way around that, turn it into an action, right? It starts to unleash our creativity, it starts to make things happen. So that's the second important thing, having projects and next actions. The third important thing for me is this idea of a Sunday maybe list. Right, so coming back to the messy cupboard. Maybe that messy cupboard or that messy room isn't very important. Great, okay, well I know that I want to clean it. I've tracked it as a thing that I want to achieve. It's a project, it's an outcome, it's something that I want done. I've tracked it, but I'm not doing it right now. GTD says you need somewhere where you put things that you're going to do someday. Right? You, you've said, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to commit to doing this, but I'm, I'm just really not doing it right now. And again, like Glass Frog will support this. It gives you the opportunity to make any of your projects future projects, and then they go kind of grey and faint and encourage you to forget about them. And I, I really like this. I find this really powerful. There's a little bit of a, a sort of side thing here, which is maybe a handy hint, which is um, Apartment Therapy, which is a great book and great blog about sort of uh, interior design in, in, in like flats and how to uh, achieve a like interior design. Yeah, it's a great little book. Anyway, one of their tips is that you have to, you just have to start your like design by decluttering. And they're like, one great way to declutter is to have an outbox, you know? You just say, okay, I'm not actually throwing this away. You know, <laughs> like this pile of junk that I have here. Don't worry, we're not throwing this away. We're just putting it in the outbox. And if it's there for, you know, a month, and we didn't worry about it, we didn't need it, we didn't notice that it was missing from our life in any way, probably now we feel emotionally detached from it, and we can just bin it, in a way that, right here and now, if I say to you, do you want to just bin this stuff, there's some emotional attachment that stops you. Someday maybe this is a bit like that, you're saying, hey, I'm not going to do this, I'm not deleting it because I, I think that it might be important, but, you know, I don't yet feel ready to, to, to get rid of it. it I find that really powerful. And being unafraid to put stuff on the Sunday maybe, Sunday maybe list. You know, like, I really try and have a rule, and it's maybe it's much easier for me, given the kind of workload that I have, I think, compared to, say, like, people who are in the tax credits, you know, like, working with tax credits clients. I, I try and have five or six projects, like, as a max. Like, even six starts to worry me, because I think, actually, like, how many of these things can I really give focus to right now, you know, as, uh, and at the moment I think I've, you know, ended up by coincidence because there were some very productive tactical meetings last week with lots of outputs, with like 10, and I feel really uncomfortable about this and desperate to try and reduce it, you know, so I'm going to maybe move some of them to Sunday maybe, or maybe see if I can just bosh some of them out today so I can get rid of them so it's back down to a reasonable size. Yeah, using the Sunday maybe list, keeping yourself with an amount of stuff that's manageable right now, again, it helps us achieve focus. Um, and a, a similar feature to Sunday maybe is to have like a waiting list. You know, things that, the projects, there are outcomes that we want to achieve that we can't do anything more on right now. Uh, and again, like, I, you know, it can be really productive to, uh, and, and so like client work is maybe a little bit more like this, like we're always just trying to kick stuff back into waiting. You know, oh, it's on us. What is the action that we can take to get it forward so that it's either done or with somebody else? You know, that's a great way to kind of like bosh through a bosh through a list. So those are some. Uh, oh yeah, and then there's so so like some key features of uh, running GTD are to have a trusted system, to distinguish projects and next actions, uh, to have your kind of Sunday maybe and waiting lists, and then finally, you know, like. 
there's a sort of spring cleaning element, right? There's something about like being properly prepared all the time. And there are a couple of rules that we can apply, which are, the first is, do delegate, well, they're sort of two nested rules. Like, it, it means that we, we go through our lists periodically, and, you know, like, maybe we do this for five minutes a day, maybe you spend 20 minutes on it a week, maybe you prefer to spend, you know, two hours on it every month, I mean, it doesn't really matter. But at some point, we do housekeeping on our list, and we say... Am I really working on all of the things that I'm working on? Are the things on my Sunday maybe list that I just say, this doesn't actually matter so much anymore, I can get rid of that. Or are the things on the Sunday maybe list that we look at now and we suddenly think, oh wait, that's actually become suddenly much more important, and we should bring that back and start focusing on it. So we go through and we, we, we spring clean. And then the process of spring cleaning, and it doesn't matter whether we're sort of spring cleaning our trusted system or whether we're spring cleaning the inboxes that feed into it, we go through and we, we, we can apply this rule of do, delegate, defer, and drop, right? So, uh, the, uh, and then the sub-rule of the two-minute rule. So, the, okay, the two-minute rule is whenever you're looking at a to-do a to -do list, I mean, it, 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 and it's, it's a figurative two minutes, but essentially it says, if you're ever faced with a task where the cost of actually doing it is fairly similar to the cost of capturing it to do another day, just do it now. So, you know, it might not be a two-minute rule. For some tasks, it might be an hour rule. You know, for some complicated piece of client work, it might actually be that to really capture everything that you need to do on this piece of work so that you can pick it up at some point in the future will take you a long time. And actually, it would just be quicker to just do it now. Great, just do it now. Some things just do now. Other things keep and have them on your list of things that you're going to do. But then, like, delegate means push it to the waiting list. Somebody else is looking after it. Defer means push it into the someday maybe list. Drop means delete it. I'm not doing it. I've taken it out of the system. It doesn't matter to me anymore. So that's a little bit about, like, GTD and how it works. And I, I want to just sort of draw on some of the things that I think are really powerful about this system because, you know, like, it, it, it does have its detractors and I'm really aware that Dan is one of them. So, you know, he will give you his side of the story, I'm sure. Um, but what are the things here, if we don't like GTD, that we can take away and find in another system or what are the benefits that we can get out of it? Well, the, the first is... It's a system that focuses on a really clear definition of done, right? The idea of working with projects is, whenever we have a project, we're saying, this is an outcome that I really want to achieve. And the better that we can get when we have a project at describing what is the real outcome that we want to achieve here, the better a definition of done we have. You know, so often in life, we think, oh, I'd like to do that, and we sort of start doing it, and we never say to ourselves, how are we going to measure this? How are we going to know if we actually did the thing that we want to do? What will it look like? How will we satisfy ourselves that we're finished? But there's something really cool about when we do set a really good measurement, because then we just know unambiguously, is this project done or not? Have I achieved the thing that I set out to achieve or not? And hey, maybe as we go along, we'll discover that we want to change that outcome, that now we have more information, we want to achieve something slightly different. But there's something so helpful about having that um, yeah, having that unambiguous sense of the fact that you've uh, got there. And sort of linked to that is, you know, when we work with the end in mind, when we work with the, the, the sort of the North Star in mind, we don't get caught up in things that aren't important, right? Coming back to why are we learning about GTD because it's about focus. So traditional approaches to project planning say, you know, what you should do is you should go, like, it's the Gantt chart, right? You should plot out every step. But GTD and other sort of approaches to natural project planning say, why? You know, we're, we're then investing too much time in the mythical future rather than in what's actually here and now. And there's something about the fact that actually our own natural inbuilt creativity, right? The, what I would argue is like the sort of the creative force that's just present in, in the universe, right? It's kind of here, it's all around us. Will evolve us towards the final destination if we keep our intention that that's where we want to go to. 
Right? It will just keep suggesting, if we ask it, a next action that we can take right now to move us in that direction. So what we get by focusing on the end, by focusing on the definition of done, is we don't get too caught up in all of the, th all of the things that we put on the list that we said that we would do to get there. We just focus on getting there. Like, what's the next thing that I can do now to get me there? What's the quickest way that I can get there? What's the biggest just sort of stride towards my ultimate destination that I can take now, rather than worrying about ticking everything that we said that we were going to tick off the list, off the list. Um, and there's also something about GTD which has a kind of a certain amount of judo about it, right? It's about directing the energy to where we want it to go. So if we're in the middle of something and we find, oh, I'm getting caught up in, you know, thinking about things that I should be doing or whatever, great. Get them down into a trusted system and then get back to whatever it was that you were doing. You know, it, so, you know, when you, it, and then, you know, the example is, you know, you see the light, coming back to the light bulb story, guys, the bit that you maybe heard or didn't know when we were remote. You see the light bulb, great, it's in the trusted system and now I'm back to focusing on the thing that I was supposed to be doing here, which was, you know, like, unpacking my bag or taking my coat off or arriving at home after, you know, like a day out or a day at work or whatever it is, right? We're, we're allowing ourselves to direct energy to where it needs to go and then to come back to the task that we want to get to. There's a really nice way of understanding DTD, which is, it's actually not about productivity. Although it's called getting things done, and it says the, the way to achieve stress-free productivity, that's sort of the little tagline for it. It's less about productivity and more about bringing the appropriate level of awareness to everything that we, to everything that we do. Um, so I touched on this a little bit earlier. There are some things that Alacracy requires of us here which actually make GTD a really sensible set of tools to use. So, you know, we are required, as I mentioned, for uh, having, you, you know, responsible for um, breaking down... Oh, you can't see that. Okay. Well, no, you can. Great. We're responsible for breaking down our projects into next actions, you know, always taking the actions that we can to move those outcomes forward. And similarly, you know, we're responsible for generating projects and next actions out of our, out of our roles, accountabilities and purpose. Like, which is just, I mean, it's, a, it's just a way of saying, like, we're always getting stuff done in service of the roles that we hold, right? Um... And you are also required to track, capture somewhere your projects and next actions. There's no specification about how you have to do that. Uh, Glassfrog obviously provides you with the space to do that, but you can do it in any way that you like, right? You can say, well, all of my client work uh, is captured in Pipedrive or is captured in Guardian. Great, well, no need to duplicate that, right? Just have it captured in one trusted place. But do remember that these are things that we are uh, required to do in, in the tactical module. And, I, and as I say, like, I do think they have this really strong advantage, right? They actually allow us to be... Like, so that thing about, like, the... So going back to this point about, um, you know, an unambiguous definition of done, right? Like, how will we... How will we... Mm, 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 how will we... Measure success? This is... Uh, uh, and, and, and therefore sort of thinking about like what might be alternatives if we didn't like GTD. Like we've, you know, you've seen the kind of, uh, you know, visual workflow stuff that we have up in the, in the office upstairs. One of the key principles in using like a visual workflow board is that it's making, it's giving you like an unambiguous definition of done. Like every column should be unambiguous. Like we know that when work is in this state, it's definite, something is definitely true about it, you know? Something is definitely true about it. So we can't say, oh yeah, okay, so this is now in, you know, the column where, okay, calcs are done, great. Are calcs done? Mm, well, kind of. I mean, they're done or not done, right? And working together on it, we want to know, have we got to the point at which things are actually done and we can move on to the next thing, or is there still some work that needs done? Um, so it helps us kind of collaborate more to also to follow those rules. Um, yeah, so that I think is everything that I wanted to say. Um, and yeah, it would be great to know uh, what people's thoughts are. Or questions or...
Well, indeed, anything. Just to clarify, um, the constitution is. We, I'm not exactly sure exactly what you said. If it was, we have to keep the next actions for our projects and stuff in there. So it's an accountability in every role to do that. We don't have so. Unless you have another trusted system. I mean, yeah, let's look at it. Let's actually look at what it says. Um, it says, so, you're responsible for regularly considering how to enact your role's purpose and accountabilities by defining next actions and projects. You're responsible for regularly considering how to complete each project you're actively working towards for your role, your role including defining any next actions you sort to move the project forward. I mean, lots of words in that sentence, but we can see that it's basically saying, you know, you're responsible for... It doesn't say, you know, it doesn't say you have to write them down yeah, or define them. Saying, it just says you have to yeah, consider them. Consider and define, but it doesn't actually have to be written down. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, yeah. what this is basically saying is, you know, an outcome is a, um, you know, is a, is a complex thing to achieve. Uh, like a project, you know, is an outcome, is a complex thing to achieve. So you've always got to be thinking about, like, how do I actually advance that outcome? What's the thing that I can do? Um, and then it does say... You are responsible for capturing and tracking all projects and next actions for your role in a database. Okay. Um, so there is a written... Aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Now, or similar tangible form. I mean, it's a bit of a weird one because there is later on uh, in the... in the... in the G... G... section... Circle members, you have a duty to provide transparency when requested by your fellow board of circle members. You must share any projects or next actions you're tracking for your roles. So it's like remember this sort of general principle that stuff that is tactical is kind of, as it were, um, uh, well, no, it's like stuff that is sort of the, the execution. Is kind of sort of personal to you, is what I sort of want to say. Like, it's, it's not totally clear cut, but did, did you come along the other week when we were talking about like the four spaces, the different spaces, and um, the sort of the, the individual space where I go and do my job is definitely my responsibility. Um, and, and, and so there's a, there's a little bit of an ambiguity here, which is like, we're saying, oh, you should be breaking down all of your projects into next actions. Well, my advice today is, hey, that will actually, you know, really help you achieve those things if you do that. It will help you achieve focus, and it will help you get stuff done. Um, but who's going to know that you're not doing that? Nobody, because it's tactical stuff, and it's kind of personal to you. But where other people can say, are you doing this or not? is that other people in your circle can say, what are your projects and what are their next actions? You know? So it's like, there's a sort of promise to pay on demand here, which is where you can be called to account for it, but then it says, you know, yeah, you should be doing this, at least what I take away from that is, you should be taking action in your role, you shouldn't be getting stuck on stuff, you should be moving stuff forward. Like, you should be self-managing, basically. That's how Halacracy encodes this idea that you should be self-managing. Does that, I wonder where, I wonder where that, where you're at with it now, you? Yeah, no, I mean, I was just thinking, I don't really have a lot of projects in my roles. Well, the role that I spend most time on, obviously, like, because it's all in G2 and stuff like that, so it's less, I don't really consider it project, even though you might consider each kind of project. But then with a, like a new role in like TC factoring where you know I could set myself this stuff, um, but yeah, it's just a bit of admin and thinking: Do I have to? Do I want to? I probably do because I do kind of like admin in a weird way. Um, but the other people might not want to actually write it down, and I wondered whether it's needed. And obviously, the idea of the accountabilities is so you know it's clear to everyone what is expected of you, and if for some reason you're not doing that, then you know you can say how come you're not. So I wonder how much we want to hold people accountable for that. I, I think it's really useful to, like, if there's a role that somebody holds and then just nothing seems to be happening, say, you know, 
What projects or actions are you taking to advance this role? None. Oh, okay. Why is that? Um, and, you know, for yourself, if there are roles that you want to get stuff done in, actually understanding, okay, well, what stuff am I going to do? Like, what outcomes do I want to achieve? What complex <coughs> outcomes do I want to achieve? And what actions do I want to take? And, you know, like a client project, a, a, like, a, you know, like a, a tax credit claim, is definitely a project, right? It's definitely an, an outcome with multiple steps that we want to achieve for the business. I can't just sit down and deliver the claim. I have to sit down and do some, like, other things to get me there. And, you know, we have a system that captures projects and next actions for that at the moment, you know? So, that's kind of a... Anybody else? Do people feel like they have... I don't know, because, you know, like, I've, I've been using this stuff myself for a couple of years now. So, uh, you know, I'm a bit immersed in it, and I forget, like... Whether the, I, so I sort of don't know whether this is an introduction that is at the right level. Like, do people feel like, oh yeah, I kind of understand what this GTD thing is now, and I feel like I could use it in my life, or do people think, oh yeah, well there was actually nothing there that was really original or useful for me. I kind of knew all that anyway, you know. Because there's more than we, yeah. Like, I'd be curious to know where people are at. I like seeing the alignments between like GTD and um, Constitution. So I like to form an idea. And it, it does make things more clear in my mind as well. So I find that. I read the book a few years ago and tried to use it and just sort of fell apart after a couple of months. Oh, I don't yeah. think I ever got it to a point where I was like fully using it. Um, but yeah, I feel like I, I need something to help me focus or be better organised. So yeah. I might well revisit it. I want to point out that there's a bit of a, that makes me think that there is a bit of a trap in, in GTD and, and in this like clause in the constitution which is very heavily influenced philosophically right, by GTD and the trap is, yeah like the Arnold Rimmer revision plan trap is that we spend ages filling up a list that we're never conceivably going to do everything on and there's a there's, there's a bit of a a bit of an art to this, but actually in some ways what I like about GTD is that it points us towards this art, right? Typically it's something that I like because it makes something that's maybe going on anyway into something that we start to engage with in a conscious and deliberate way. And I would say in the way that I use it now, I don't very often sort of sit down and think do I have all of the projects that I could possibly want to have? Because I already get enough information from you know, my interaction with the world about the projects, that I, about the stuff that I want to do. I already have enough stuff that I want to do generally just coming up organically through you know, creative interaction with other people and the work and you know, the thinking that you do on a bicycle or in a shower or whatever, right? They just sort of pop up. So I don't very often need that I feel that I need to fill more stuff in, although occasionally there's maybe a bit of my work, like there's a role or something where I think, oh, I'm not really getting anything done here at the moment, or this is suddenly more important to me than it has been before, and then I might sit down and spend 10, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour, whatever it is, brainstorming that a bit and thinking of things that I want to do. But the, the trap is when we try and make our list of projects utterly comprehensive, you know, when we, when we think, oh my, everything that I want out of life must be mapped into a project. And, you know, that has, uh, like, it has a mixed utility. Like, I remember when I first took on this job two years ago, uh, or more than that, two and a half years ago, um, having a, a couple of days of brainstorming with wedding where we just made a, an enormous list. And it's still there, there's still a Trello board where you could say that you were interested but you're not, why would you be, um, very sensibly, focus, um, as a lens does. <laughs> so there's this enormous Trello board of all of these ideas that we came up with about like the stuff that we could do on the you know, sort of culture project, which was what, we, what it was at the time. And 
I look back on that and I think, you know, there was enormous value in having done that brainstorming and having generated all of those ideas because it, it immersed our thinking and our creativity and our relationship and our perspective on the business into the right kind of space that we could start to get stuff done. And there were some things that we generated on that list that were generally, you know, like things that we could go away and do. Some of them were good, quick wins, some of them were sort of longer term projects. But looking back on it, now I see the value was much more in the, you know, in the, it's the Thomas Jefferson thing about, I think it's Thomas Jefferson, uh, he's one of those people that you sort of attribute a quote to if you can't remember who it belongs to, um, who said, you know, like, the plan is worthless, but planning is valuable, something like that, right? That idea that, I look back on it and I think, oh, that brainstorming exercise was useful, and the output, we could probably just have, you know, thrown away. Um, but I think at the time, I was determined that that list should become comprehensive and that everything that needed to be done should be on there and we could only really make powerful decisions about what we should be working on when we had that absolute and complete picture. And now I look back and I think, oh, there is no absolute and complete picture. You know, what a myth that I had got caught up in. Um, so yeah, like I feel like a bit of a trap is that feeling that, uh, you know, I've got to capture every last detail of everything that I want, as opposed to recognising there's already stuff coming in at me all of the time. I already have this mental inbox. Let's just start by getting that, you know, somewhere where we can start going, well, I'm only going to, of all of those things that are in my mental inbox, I'm going to sweep this hundred, or whatever it is, onto my Sunday main list, and actually just do this for, you know, right now. Maybe I'll come to those. Um, yeah, sorry, I got distracted and started talking again. But I, well, I was, yeah, interested to hear where anybody else was with this, or... I quite like the differentiation between like your head is a place to get ideas and then what was it that you know but not to store them and yeah. it's like you capture ideas but also I think if you're setting an intention for a project that you're working on some of those actions become redundant over time or like parts of different parts of the project you know or thoughts that you had that weren't actually that good and like maybe that you know seemed like a great solution at the time but uh, you know actually is like not that useful like so it just allows you to sort of focus, I guess, on that true north of what, what's important and like what you should really be aiming for, I suppose. So, yeah, quite like it. But yeah, it's good, it's good differentiations. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah. So, you were working um, like on a more client based, like tax credit sort of thing, um, and you were getting endless projects in, so you had 10, 12 projects. How could you then determine which one of those would go to the someday maybe list? Oh, yeah. If yeah, that's a great question, right? This is this sort of thorny question that we have that, um, you know, won't, yeah, I was going to say won't go away, but I'm, I'm, well, I'm just stalling for words while I think about what I want to say, cost of delay is essentially what I want to say. Like, th this question of saying, how do we determine, like, because what we should do is we should be an organization, as an organization, as we should be focused on delivering value, right? That's, that's what a business is there to do. Maybe that's what a, yeah, that's what a business is there to do. So, if we exist to deliver value, we should optimize for that, right? We should try and deliver the maximum value that we can. Now, that's a really complicated question, saying, looking at all of these different client projects, what should I work on right now? to deliver the maximum value that I can. Um, which of these things are things that could be you know, dropped or held back because they're less valuable? We only have so much capacity as an organization. Um, I mean, it's a separate question if we say, here's all of this value that we could be realizing if only we had the capacity, which means you know, there's an argument to grow capacity. But cost of delay is a really good tool for, for doing this. Remember, it's about looking at sort of do you remember this, the basics of cost of delay that you're essentially saying, what is the cost of not having this project finished right now? And what happens to that over time? And it allows us to quantify, in a, so, so a really simple way of calculating cost of delay is a um, uh, oh, whiteboard. Um, okay. Um, Yeah, it's saying like we have two dimensions where we look at client projects 
and you know, like we have sort of one dimension where we're like, you know, what is the you know sort of financial value of this project, and the other of which is you know how long is it going to take us until we realise that financial value. Because all of the value in our projects is realised right at the end, right? All of the work that you guys do in sales is realised on the day that we receive some money back from HMRC and tax credit. Until that day, everything that we've done is just work in progress, right? It's just like inventory stacking up on the factory floor, like a you know, huge pile of unfinished... Are they bosses again or not? Uh, Okay. Um, no, 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 but the credit would be the bearer of bad news, then it be... Oh, they've lost us dramatically, but I can see them here. Just saw it on Slack. You just said they've lost us. Okay, well... Google Hangouts lies. Google Hangouts lies. Hmm. Um, could somebody just launch Hangouts who's got... Um, Surprising, man. Just my white calendar is purple, so I'm always thinking, oh, calendar is a different colour. And it's like when you open it up, and someone says, oh, your, your tea calendar is orange. I don't know why you do that. <laughs> So we, we have these kind of two measures, right? Like how much value are we going to deliver from this and how long is it going to take? And like this kind of like value dimension is, you know, for tax credit claims, it's, you know, it's probably something like the expected value of the claim for us, and, you know, times, uh, you know, like a small number of, you know, extra factors. There are some multipliers on that. Like, you know, if, if a client is really important for us to keep because they're, they're a big name that we want to keep on our client roster, or if they're really important to us because we have a really strong relationship with us and there's a lot of word of mouth that we get from them, or, or whatever it might be. Or, or you know, uh, there's, um, uh, uh, yeah, okay, so those are things that we might multiply the sort of the, like the, the, the value by. And then again, with the time, probably the time value is just something like, you know, where is it? along the workflow journey, we get quite a lot of information about tax credit stuff, you know, through the, through the various CRMs about how much work is done so far or not. And again, you know, maybe there's a bit of a multiplier here because we recognise some clients are busier than others, some people take longer to send us information, some people, you know, are a bit faster. So, you know, maybe there's a bit of a multiplier. But we can see, effectively, right, if we look at these two pieces of work, you know, which of these should we do? But we should do this one because it's only going to take a very small amount of time to realise a substantial amount of value. Whereas if we do this one, you know, it's just going to take us ages to realise this. Uh, but the reality is that most pieces of client work are not as skewed as this. You know, it's like, oh, 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 oh. Which of these is more important to work on? It's hard to know, right? So. You know, when you have all of these pieces of client work that you're doing, how do you prioritize? How do you decide these are the ones that I'm focusing on now versus you know these are the ones that are on a bit more of a sort of future list? It, the answer is you, yeah, you need some tool, you need some way of uh, some uh, rule of thumb way of doing that. Does that help? I mean, in some ways it doesn't help because I'm not telling anybody how to do any of these things. I'm not, but I'm very happy if people want to work on cost of delay. I'm really happy to give time to. Yeah, I think theoretically that's like a yeah. perfect answer. I mean, taking the variable of client pressure on that as well. So, the cost of delay might be the bottom of your list, but they just put much more pressure on you. So, I guess that's when it's more difficult to to weigh up whether you have to do it now, whether it's you know that sort of that's. Oh uh, yeah. Kind of part of the so 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 the again like client pressure can come into this a bit because we can think you know like some of the value that we realise in the work. So maybe part of the multiplier or whatever is like goodwill. You know, like happy clients have a value to us as an organization. Um, and, you know, unhappy clients to some degree have a cost to us. But then also we have to get a bit hard hearted at some point and say, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what matters to us as an organization is that we continue to deliver value. And, you know, maybe there are going to be some people who aren't going to like that. Well, let's have the people who aren't going to like that be the people who are of least value to us as an organization. 
And if the people who put a lot of pressure on us and who don't like it when we take, you know, a day to respond to them rather than just a minute, our clients who actually don't realise very much value for us as an organisation, then probably have to say, okay, maybe it's just better for them to be unhappy. But then we have to weigh that up, right? Like, if they're very well-connected clients, the cost of their unhappiness might be disproportionate to us because of the word-of-mouth effect. But, you know, if they're not very well-connected clients, maybe it's just better for them to be a bit unhappy. I mean, that's certainly what, you know, like, you know, massively successful companies that operate on a multinational scale, like Airbnb, Amazon, etc., they know some people are just going to be unhappy. It's kind of the nature of business. Some of your clients are going to be unhappy. Okay, well, let's try and focus so that the people who are unhappy are not the highest value clients. It's a bit of an answer, but I also recognise that, you know, there's, there's pressure and we feel it and there are personal relationships at stake. So it's, it's just about providing us with some tools that allow us to navigate the kind of pain of that dilemma. Anybody else? Rowan? And um, yeah, I, I hear a bit of fun, um, but if you can, is it, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I use uh, bits and pieces of this uh, fairly, for a good while. Um, one of the ones that I find most uh, useful is the saying goodbye to stuff and getting it out of like closing loops. So basically just, you know, I, I use Inbox Zero to uh, form of that as well. So with the amount of some things like getting took a while, but like trying to get quick with stuff that maybe I would like to do, but I don't think I'll get ever get to. So it's almost a yeah, to the dropping and stuff I find really useful. And like clears clears the head and close there's not so many open loops that I will never get to and find that good. And um, and then the other thing that I find less good with what we discussed today is the two minute rule. Um, mm. It doesn't work particularly well for me. I find um, I I can get bugged if it, if I if I like try to look at everything that comes my way and start to do it, even if it's kind of quicker to document it. I I, I fall into a bit of a trap doing stuff that's in the less important, even not so urgent quadrant. Um, so for me, it works better to try and prioritize really quickly and make quick decisions about stuff that I don't, I'm not going to get to and actually doesn't really matter. Yes, yes, that I think is a really good point and I'm going to see if, uh, it's only going to open up over here. Okay, so I want to say something like GTD, uh, what is this? It's this. It's this. It's this. Um, have I? Oh no. Well, you won't be able to see that, Rowan, but I will send it to you afterwards. Um, okay. Oh no, it's not. It doesn't actually. It doesn't actually uh, capture it here. Okay. So, but there is a little bit of a of a trick here that I can offer you which is the sort of standard GTD workflow says, once we've identified the next action on something. Oh yeah, no, it is here, it is here. I'm sorry, it is here, it is here. So you know I said it was, um, what did we say it was? Do, defer, delegate, and drop. Although they go together neatly as four Ds, <coughs> the thing that this diagram captures is that the drop question actually comes first. So, you know, you were saying there, Rowan, like, oh, lots of things come your way, and maybe they could just be done quickly and you get caught up in them. The first gate is kind of, actually, do I want to have anything to do with this at all? You know, it's back to the, is this my business? Because if something comes your way, you know, and you, before you get caught up in the task at all, you stop and think, do I want to actually have anything to do with this? Like, is this actually valuable at all for me to ever work on? And if the yeah. answer to that is no, great, fine, next thing. But if the answer to that is genuinely yes, like, this would actually be something that would be valuable for me to work on, then the two-minute rule really just says, you know, is it going to be quicker for me to do this than to make a note with all of the information that I need to come back to this in the future? And, you know, if all it is is, uh, you know, like, if, if the note would take you 
15 seconds to write down, you're just like, oh, capture that as a project and put it straight onto future task. Boom. You know, 15, 30 seconds or something. Mm. So, so, you know, the, the, there, are sort of, there are two sort of fine tunings, one of which is making that drop decision first, and the other of which is, like, on this sort of two-minute rule, like, you know, if you know for yourself that you have, a, like, a desire to be involved in lots of stuff, like, interesting stuff comes your way, and you think, I'd love to be involved in that, I want to help other people, I want to be, you know, really impactful, I want to get involved in it, and you know that that's both a good quality, but it has its downside... You know, one thing that you can even do is to say, you know, make it like a literal time window rule. So that you're like, oh, you know, here's this thing that's come in and you can make it a 45 second rule or a, you know, 30 second rule or, a, or, or the two, two minutes. And if literally, if you find you're still doing it after two minutes, it's like, oh, not allowed to do any more of that now. You know, have to capture that and work on it another day. Yeah, there's, there's a... There's a... A tool that I found kind of useful to help with the dropping of stuff because it, for me it was difficult at the start because I just found like oh but you know I have input here so I, you know but like mm -hmm. um, it was using use my diary and basically just pop something in it's like actually when when am I realistically going to do this if I don't know and if you say oh I might be able to do it there in two days time or something and then it comes up and then you like you're not in a space where you want to approach it even then, that's like, okay, that's not important, go on. Great, yeah, I like that, thank you. And, you know, I also, like, I feel a bit like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just want to acknowledge that I really appreciate you sharing the, the way that you've approached this and the bits of it that you find difficult, and I know you instantly went into saying, oh, here's a way that I can fix your problem, which maybe you did want or maybe you didn't want. <laughs> A bit of unsolicited advice giving. But yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Unsolicited advice, very welcome. Thanks. Okay, cool. Uh, anybody else? Are we good? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, oh, my goodness, it's five past two. I'm so sorry we've got a rush. See you next week. Or maybe I'm away next week, but something will be happening. <laughs> thank Love you, Andrew. Bye, folks. Thanks, Andrew. I know, yeah, I know. Terrible irony. Yeah.